Good morning. God is good. And all the time? Yes, he is. Well, it is an honor to be with you here today. And uh, I have uh, grown up as a native Southern Californian. Uh, and, um, you know, I have pastors, colleagues. Obviously, I got the gray hair. I've been in ministry for a long time. Uh, I will let you know that I grade preemie, though. You know, my dad grade when he was about 30. Uh, so it's mostly just wisdom that the gray hair comes from, you know. So don't worry. My wife is probably watching going, oh, no, they're going to think he's telling the truth. I am joke. I joke a lot. So you got to pay attention, okay? Um, but I've had pastor friends saying, you know, so, so where have you been in your ministry? And I say, Southern California. And they go, and where else? I go, Southern California. And they're like, man, you've only been in Southern California your whole life for ministry? And I said, when God loves you? <laughs> See, those who are from Southern California know, right? He says, this is my child. We're going to keep him in the promised land. Now, I know there's a lot of great places in, in this country. I've traveled, and there are beautiful places in this country. But God has given me a calling for the people of Southern California. And uh, we have a wonderful mission field. We have a great mission field here in Southern California. But I have wonderful memories of Laguna. I can remember uh, many times uh, walking down PCH and Laguna. And um, the first time I took a surfboard out was in Dana Point. And, of course, that's a great place to go your first time, right? Nice, slow, small waves. Uh, and, and on the same day, we went to the secret spot, which Ritz Carlton purchased after a period of time. Uh, of course, nobody knew about that spot at that time, it seemed like, but now everybody knows about that spot. <clears throat> but um, it, is, it is truly good to be here. Uh, I also am married. I've been married for 35 years to a wonderful godly woman named Lisa, who is a marriage family therapist. So I like to say I've been in therapy for 35 years. Uh, God knew I needed a therapist in residence, and yeah, I truly have, and uh, she's been the greatest greatest vessel of God's grace in my life. And uh, so I praise God for her. Uh, I also have two adult children, Alana, who's 22, who goes to La Sierra University, and my son, Drew, who lives out in Tennessee, uh, out by Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, he loves living out there. He loves the outdoors. In fact, he's camping in Alabama this weekend with a whole group of friends, and he sent pictures on his Instagram of the sunrise. They watched the sunrise and having an incredible Sabbath out there. So, but that's just a little bit about me. Um, I've been serving in this role as ministerial director for the last three years. So just before COVID hit, I got to uh, dive into all of that, as many of you got to experience COVID uh, as well. So it's been a journey. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to our pastoral team here. Thank you, Pastor Joseph, and your leadership here, and uh, your associates as well. Tanya, thank you for all the work that you do, and Lynette, as well, and all the work you do, and your spouses and families who support you in ministry. Uh, ministry is a tough calling. I will tell you, it is a tough calling. And uh, it's done only by the grace of God. I try to remind our pastors that pastoral ministry is only done by grace through faith. Everything we do is out of our power because it's kingdom work. And we're not talking about dealing with things that we can only see with our eyes, but what we can't see, right? The eternal things are the things we can't see. The temporary things are the things we can see. And as pastors, we're called to deal with spiritual things and physical things and, and things of life and humanity. But it's a calling you have to accept to say, I'm willing to be out of control my whole career. And that's a tough one, isn't it? So we appreciate your support for our pastoral staff here and all that they've done through COVID. I remember the first time I met Joseph and his wife uh, it was during COVID, and we, when we interviewed him at the conference, we were out in the warehouse because we weren't inside. So we had to have open space, open air and everything, and we met him out in the warehouse at the conference office, and uh, you chose him that night to be your pastor here. So it's good, good to have you all here, and thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate, Anda, your music on the piano. Thank you so much. I was a music major before I went theology, so I played the string bass. And uh, so I really appreciate, I always appreciate good music. And I appreciate your worship this morning. It's really good to come to a church to hear worship, to hear singing, and to hear God being praised and lifted up. Appreciate the worship team as well. Well, <clears throat> let me get to what we're going to talk about today, and that is mentoring. And by the grace of God, I have had incredible mentors my whole life and still have some incredible mentors. 
And by the grace of God, I have had the pleasure and the honor to come alongside people and mentor as well. I want to suggest to you today that um, we have a discipleship crisis in our denomination. In fact, I'm not just going to suggest it, I'm going to prove it. We, someone's at the door. Let get that. Amazon's delivering or something. Uh, we have a discipleship crisis in our church. Can you hear that this morning? It's important that you hear this this morning because we have to do something about it. We have a discipleship crisis. I was recently um, at some meetings for the North American Division with ministerial directors for an advisory committee on discipleship in our country. And uh, first of all, before I get to some actual hard numbers, I want to visit a very well-known passage where we get this call to make disciples from, Matthew chapter 28. We're going to put it on the screen. I'm going to put it in the King James versions first, okay? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth, and ye, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is where we get our great gospel commission to go make disciples, to go teach, and to go baptize. But did you notice the word disciple does not appear in this passage? Did you notice that when you read it? Go back to the previous one, if you would. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now, for many years, many of us in the Adventist church relied on the King James Version. It's a wonderful version. However, there are some things that King James didn't get quite right, or he chose also not to get quite right. That's a deeper hole we could get into. But the word disciples missing. They decided to say teach. So you could actually conceive and come up with a working philosophy that we could go out and teach and baptize and we're doing our job and forget that we're about making disciples. And in fact, for a large part, I'm going to say it out loud, that's what the Adventist church has done. And we're going to see those numbers. And it's going to hit you hard this morning because we have a crisis. Now let's look at the NIV. NIV says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We have a call to make disciples of Jesus to submerge them in the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded and taught. But if we have thought that our mission is go teach and baptize, and we don't make disciples, we lose a lot of people. Let me share some real numbers with you. This was just given to me about three three to four weeks ago. So these are fresh from the general conference. We currently have 22 million members in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 22 million members. Now that's not a lot worldwide if you really think about it, but that's a good number. 22 million is a good number. That means that these people's names, many of us, are on a piece of paper somewhere or in a database somewhere as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The next number is how many we know are attending. Would you put up the next number, please? Six million. Six million, the GC says we know, are attending worldwide. Do we have a discipleship crisis in our church? 22 million, six million are attending. That comes out to 27% are attending. Actually, I did the math, 27.2727. 27% are attending, which means how many are missing? Yes, 73, I rounded, 73%. 73% are missing. This is why I say we have a discipleship crisis in our denomination. Because when we make disciples of Jesus, we learn 
that we count on Jesus and not an organization. You see, as we proclaim the three angels' message, if I'm relying on an organization to save me and to come through in the end, oh, I've got a rock that's not going to, it's not a rock, it's sinking sand. But if I learn to count on Jesus and the kingdom of God, then I'm standing on the rock. If I've learned how to live at the feet of Jesus and to follow Jesus, then it doesn't matter. Let's just be real, okay? The church isn't perfect, right? Can I get an amen for that? (laughs) Because if you think the church is perfect, we need to preach another sermon. Because as long as you and I are in the church, it's not going to be perfect. Because humans are not perfect. We've got issues. Remember, I'm married to a therapist. She's helped me with a lot of this. We have issues. We have things we're working out. And church leadership has not always made the best decisions. Let me just say it that way. There's been good decisions and there's been poor decisions. There's been godly decisions. There's been selfish decisions. There's been kingdom decisions and there's been empire decisions. But God is still on the throne. And so we have this discipleship crisis. The next number I want to share with you is that for every 100 baptisms, 39 leave. For every 100 baptisms, 39 leave. 40%. Now, either we are using the model of commercial enterprise, you know how that works today, we'll just get them through the door (laughs) with a 5% discount on something they're probably not really interested in, but they'll buy something else when they come in the store. They're hoping we spend more money, right? So if we can just get them in the tank, there's greater chance at least we'll still have 60%. Now, I'm pretty sure that's not what we're counting on, and I hope not. But you see, for those of you who understand business, you know that you will get certain results that you've planned to get, or you have a structure in place that's going to give you certain results. Well, we've had a certain structure in our denomination for a long time that has given us certain results. And it has not been a discipleship process. Now, I'm not saying that there are not disciples in the, in the church. There are. I'm not saying that nobody has been making disciples in our church. They have been. The fact that some of us are still here means somebody has helped disciple us and learn how to have a relationship with Jesus, right? I had a point in my own life. You know, we all have those periods in our life where we wrestle with God and we have those dark nights of the soul. And I remember when I was a young pastor, and please pray for our young pastors, because it's in those first five years usually when they decide if they're going to stay in pastoral ministry or not. And we have a gap. We have a gap between young pastors and older pastors, and there's hardly any in between because so many had left. And I remember I was having my own my own deep search with God, and God, are you still calling me to pastoral ministry? Are you still, I'm really questioning that, whether I should stay in pastoral ministry. And you know, it was a Baptist minister that God used to speak to me. And he said to me and my colleagues, he says, John, I get the sense that you and your friends are thinking of leaving Adventist pastoral ministry. And we shook our heads. We said, yes, we are. And this Baptist minister said to these young Adventist pastors, he says, Just remember, God needs disciples in the Adventist church too. And that kept me in the church. Oh, not the church, in pastoral ministry. Because I was reminded of my calling as a pastor was to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's what I set myself to do for the rest of my ministry. For every 100, 39 are leaving. The average age in the church, 51 years old. I'm above average. (laughs) Take that however you want. I'm 57. The average age is 51. Some of you are going, that's old. Some of you are going, that's young. Some of you are going, that's me. (laughs) And of the 6 million... Of the 27%, you know how many are young adults? 
4% are young adults. So now, you know, it's always interesting when I go to different churches, every church defines youth differently. See, to me, I grew up youth being high school, junior high, you know. You go to some other churches and you find out youth means up to 40 years old. Maybe even to almost 50. Thank you for the links you sent me of some of the previous sermons because I learned that youth is a matter of your heart, right? Is that what I heard? Something like that? So I'm still a youth. All right, have I proved that we have a crisis? We have a crisis, a discipleship crisis. And there's only one way to correct this problem, church. We desperately need mentors. We desperately need mentors, not just mentors in general, but we need mentors who are disciples of Jesus who know and experience Jesus as their Lord, Savior, Master, and friend. It's essential. We need mentors in our church who know Jesus, who are disciples of Jesus, who know him as Lord, Savior, Master, and friend. And may I just remind us that we are friends with God because he chose to be our friends. Not because I earned the right to be his friend. By grace. Always, always by grace. Let me explain this a little bit more. I'm going to unpack it. Uh, I don't know how long I've been talking. Um, It says 759. I'm not sure what that number means. At first, I thought that was my running clock, and it's been there for five minutes or ten. Maybe it's eternal time, so I can go as long as I want. (laughs) I'll go as long as until I smell the food. Does that work? (laughs) No, I'm sorry. I have to be careful because I'm half Italian, so I can talk. But if I smell food, I can stop, all right? But let me explain this a little bit. I want to explain what I'm talking about. I'm going to draw on a couple passages and I want, to, I want to draw, I loved sitting here, by the way, and I forgot about this wonderful stained glass window that you have here. You know, I, I love the vine and the branches, the vineyard of God. You know, if, I would encourage you every Sabbath when you come, if you don't do it all already, come and just, I'll say meditate, but I like to use the word marinate. Marinate in this wonderful visual of of salvation history, if you will, surrounded by the vineyard. And I want to talk about that vineyard a little bit today because in John 15, my favorite chapter in all of Scripture, John 15, Jesus gives this great analogy where he says, right, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And I want to put up verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, right, if you make your abode in me, If you reside in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do maybe five out of ten things really well. Is that what it says? It's hard. It's hard as Americans to be told that we can do nothing. Isn't it? Come on, let's pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can make it happen. Where there's a will, there's a way. If you have a dream, it can happen. Jesus says, when it comes to things of eternity and when it comes to kingdom economy, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, you, not might, you will bear much fruit. Just abide in me. Okay? I like to call that priority number one for the disciple. An abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. The next one goes a little bit further in chapter 15. We get down to verse 12, and he says, My command is this, love each other, how? As I have loved you. Oh, that's a whole other type of love right there. You know, we talk about love. The Beatles wrote about love. Everybody sings and talks about love, right? It's however you define love. Just go love people. That's a wonderful thing. But it's a whole other thing when we love people like Jesus has loved us. 
Because that's a sacrificial type of love. That's a love that's willing to put ego to death. That's a love that's willing to forgive even though I've been greatly wronged. That's a love that we could go on and on. But you see, that's different. You know, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your, your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And the second, love your neighbor like yourself. Well, Jesus then upped it. He said, my command is this. Don't love your neighbor like yourself. Love them like I love you. I could pray right there, couldn't I? I could just stop. If we took that home for the rest of the week, what would that mean for you and I? To love the people in my life like Jesus has loved me. To love the people at work like Jesus has loved me. To love the people at school. To love the people out at the store. To love the people in my neighborhood like Jesus has loved me. That's a whole new vision, maybe, to think about. But I would call that priority number two. And the third priority is found at the very end of John chapter 15. The very last verse, Jesus says, And you also will bear witness. Why? Because you've been with me from the beginning. You see, Jesus says to his disciples, you'll bear witness. Not just go bear witness. He says, you'll bear witness because you've been with me. He's saying, it's impossible not to bear witness about me if you've been with me. Because when we live life as disciples of Jesus at his feet, we enter a relationship with him. And we learn from him. And he teaches us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Christ, in fact, Jesus himself in us through the Holy Spirit informs our minds and our hearts. And the neurons begin firing a new way. And the neurons begin wiring a new way. And we experience a renewing of the mind. And of the will. And of the heart. And the character. By being a disciple of Jesus. And so these three priorities. The first one, I like to use concentric circles, if you will. Priority number one is abiding in Christ. Priority number two, it then overflows into loving one another like Christ has loved us. And that overflows to bear witness, priority number three, that we have been with him. It's like if you took a, a, took a stone and you threw it in a, in a pond and it just rippled. That's what happens. You see, Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Not a little, not might, but you will bear much fruit. And and I tend to think that the greatest fruit I can bear in my life is to love someone like Jesus has loved me. And the greatest fruit I can do as I do that is to bear witness about Jesus. To join him in his mission that God loves you and has redeemed you and has done everything to restore you. You see, because of Jesus Christ... Because of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is now an option for all of us. And it never was before Jesus. But he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And that's why he preached the kingdom of God is now here. It's right next to you. And you can enter in. And that's why everyone's blessed. Whether you're poor, whether you're mourning, whatever it is, the kingdom of God has come to you because in his day, all the religious leaders said, you got to do certain things to, to get into the kingdom. you got to have enough money. you got to have enough status, enough power. And Jesus broke all that down and said, the kingdom of God is here. You're blessed. It's now an option for everyone. Everyone gets to sit at the table of God. So these three priorities. I want to I use an illustration. I, brought, I, I like to bring my own illustrations. I'm a visual person, and I think many of you might be as well. So I brought this with me today, and let me just share with you that almost everything I am sharing with you today, I learned from mentors. People who poured into my life, people who who brought me in and taught me how to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this very illustration was was shared with me by a mentor of mine um, almost 30 years ago. And he said, John, the Christian life, first of all, remember this. He would say this. Remember the Christian life is not about a what, it's about a who. Okay, remember the Christian life is always about a who and not a what. And you say the Christian life is is like this pitcher cup saucer plate. And he, he was doing this while he was in the hospital. Okay, this is how much he bared witness of Jesus. 
He was in the hospital, and he took this pitcher, and he took this cup. While he's in a hospital bed, right, with that little table that goes over your hospital bed, and he goes, this is God. This is my life. God wants to pour into my life. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. And he wants to pour himself, Christ in us, into this cup. We sing about it in one of our songs, your holy presence living in me. Pours into my life. And he says, John, there was a little saucer on the table there, and he says, this saucer represents the relationships in my life. People. And he says, God wants to pour into my life so much so that it begins to overflow the cup and spill out onto the relationships that I have with people. In other words, love others like Christ has loved you. And it happens naturally, out of the overflow, right? Jesus said, he talked about overflow, didn't he? That he was the living water, and he talked about if someone is in me and I'm in them, like they'll, have, they'll have a well of water flowing out of their life, never growing dry, spilling out onto the people of their life. And then he says, John, this plate, this plate represents the tasks, things, the to-do lists, the things you have to get done at work, home, whatever it might be, school. And he says, God wants to pour into my life as I abide in him, and he wants to then, he will overflow out of the cup of my life onto my relationships that I will love others like Christ has loved me, and that will spill onto how I go about getting things done. I will bear witness as I get my things done during the day that I've been with Jesus. I think it was Martin Luther who said, preach at all times, and when necessary, use words. <laughs> right? Actions speak louder than words. So we don't always have to just, you know, go up to a stranger at 7-Eleven and go, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I remember I was doing a, uh, an evangelism class at a church I was at years ago. It was called Project Andrew, you know, because Andrew was the first person to lead someone to Jesus. And, and uh, we were role-playing. And uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the, I'll say the classics in the church, I won't say old-timer, one of the classics in the church was in this group. And uh, I said, who wants to role-play? He goes, I'll do it. You know, he, he thought he had it down, and he had it down pretty good. And he went over, and I uh, said, okay, we need somebody to be the stranger, you know, in Starbucks or whatever it is. And so this one young guy, this young guy, I go, I'll do it. And this guy had just become a Christian, like, you know, six months ago, got baptized. <laughs> he, and, and we said, you know, now you don't want to go up and just right out of the blue say, do you know Jesus, you know? And so he did that for fun, right? So in this role play, he goes up to this young adult, and he goes, do you know Jesus? And this young adult, as quick as can be, said, I don't know, what's his last name? <laughs> I thought, that was brilliant. Because there's a lot of people who might say that. But as we go about our lives and our relationships and the things we do, there's this overflow of this, like a vineyard, it's organic. Right? The Christian life and the church is meant to be a living organi uh, organism, not organization. Now, there's organizational structures that we have to have in a denomination our size, but if it becomes more organizational than it is a living organism as the people of God, as the vineyard of God, we're in trouble. And so, now let me say something. Jesus is not calling us to do this. I'm just going to be alone time 24-7. Now, if you're like me, some of you out there are morning people, right? Now, right now, all the evening people are going, oh, I hate these morning people. They irritate me. My wife is an evening person. She tells me my happy's too loud in the morning. Because I love the morning. I love the morning. I love getting up early. I love having a few hours, just time with God, time to, you know, do some contemplation, do some deep work, all those types of things. I love it. You know, she comes downstairs. How's it going? I'm like, great. She goes, your happy's a little too loud right now. Just pull it back, okay? But then her happy's too loud at night. Right? I'm like starting to crash. She's like, you can't fall asleep. The game's still going, you know. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, you happy's too loud, honey, please. Uh -oh. So he's not saying just, you know, just be alone 24-7, a life of solitude. There needs to be solitude. There needs to be those moments. But he calls us to be in relationship with others. Now, what he's not asking us to do also is to ignore this and just say, God, would you just bless my relationships? Just bless them. Would you please just bless all the things on my to-do list? Just, just please. Meanwhile, 
I'm just like doing this. And he's like, wait, I'm trying to catch up with you, <laughs> right? No, I, hurry up, God, I got to get going, you know? We're worried and bothered and distracted by many things. I always like to joke and say, you know, Jesus knew exactly when to come. There was no technology yet. He didn't have disciples on their cell phones, right? They walked and they talked. They, didn't, they just walked. They were never in a hurry. You ever notice Jesus was never in a hurry? Now, arguably the, most, the busiest person who ever walked the face of this earth but never in a hurry. There's a difference. That's a whole nother sermon. Something maybe we'll get into in our panel about the pace of life. Our pace of life has to slow down if we're going to mentor and be disciples of Jesus. It has to. Because the pace of life tends to squeeze out time with God. The pace of life squeezes out times to serve. That's a whole other thing. I didn't have that in my notes. I don't want to go there. It'll take too much time. But he doesn't, he's not asking us, but God, I've got all these ministries to do, right? That's not what he's saying. God, too much stuff on the to-do list. I'll get to you next week. That's not what he's talking about, right? I mean, we could go on with all the different scenarios and so forth. But this is the ideal rhythm of life and flow of life and priorities of life that God calls us to. You know, we talk about having balance in our life. I personally think that's way overrated, <laughs> right? I mean, how many of us have finally got the perfect balance in our life? Maybe some of us are like, yeah, I finally retired. I'm playing more golf. I'm surfing more. No, I don't know. But I gave up on balance a long time ago because I realized I'm the one trying to balance. I need God to balance my life. And so I think instead of God calling us to a life of balance, he's calling us a life of being well-ordered. Priority one, priority two, priority three. Abide and everything else will happen. I talked about living life at the feet of Jesus. And oftentimes when I say that, people think that just means alone time with God. And that's not just what it means. Because Jesus' feet did not stay in one place. You see, living life at the feet of Jesus as a disciple is a posture of the heart. Which the beautiful part of that is nobody, no power, no person, no system can ever remove you from the feet of Jesus. Ever. And if I'm choosing to live life at the feet of Jesus, it means I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to be present to Jesus, which means there's going to be times he's going to say, let's get away to a quiet place. Right? The scripture says Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. Even when ministry was just banging at the door. And he would invite his disciples, let's get away for a little while. There are times at that. Then there are times when Jesus' feet took his disciples to do ministry. He took them to places. And Jesus, if we're following the feet of Jesus, he's going to take us to places we probably would never want to go at times. Things that are way out of our comfort zones. Because Jesus' feet always crosses those lines that humankind has created, but the kingdom of God is wanting to penetrate. And so there are times that the, the feet of Jesus will say, let's get alone. There are times when the feet of Jesus will say, let's be together in community as fellow disciples and learn from one another at the feet of Jesus. And there are times the feet of Jesus will go on mission outside of the church walls and the church community to bear witness of Jesus. So these three priorities, pitcher cup, saucer plate, John 15, one other example I want to use. Well, first, before I do that, I want to make this statement that Christian mentoring comes from the overflow. Okay? I just want that to say Christian mentoring comes from the overflow. It happens organically as we are with people. Okay? I also want to make this statement. A Christian mentor is someone who is coming along someone to help them learn and experience how to live life with Jesus, learning from Jesus as his, Jesus' disciple. See, when we mentor, we don't make disciples of ourselves, right? I don't make disciples of John. I'm there to make disciples of Jesus. So I am showing the best I can, all by the grace of God, 
this is how it works for me. This is how I do it. Learn from me as best you can, maybe in specific ways. There's specific times and seasons of mentoring. There are times I've had mentors for seasons of my life. I've had lifelong mentors. I'm at that age now where most of my mentors are no longer alive. But I'm still learning from them, if you get what I mean. Because they've had that type of influence. But living out of that overflow and teaching, and, and how we do that is we, we teach people, we show, we model how to sit at the feet of Jesus and how to pay attention to the feet of Jesus. I told you we have this big gap <clears throat> of pastors, not just in this conference, but in every conference. And one of the projects that my department's working on, that the union's working on, and the division's working on, is what we call next-gen pastor. So we are actively working on being intentional and going into our schools, our academies, and working through our churches with public school students too to say, hey, do you think there's any possibility you might be sensing God calling you to pastoral ministry? We took a little survey last spring with five of our eight senior academies. And we, we said, you know, if you've been sensing God's call, we asked some other questions. We said, if you're sensing God's call, maybe that he might be calling you as a pastor and you'd like to talk to someone, put your name down in the name of your school, and we would, we would love to talk to you. Do you know we had 40, four, zero kids who said, I want to talk to somebody because I think God might be calling me to be a pastor. 40 kids. High school age. And we had 75 say, maybe, let me think about it. That's over 100. The reason I'm telling you this is because we're hoping that by the grace of God, we might be able to come alongside them and not tell them what God is telling them, but help them and to listen together with them. And to say, what do you hear God saying? And giving them time to be alone with God and, and processing together and talking about ministry and answering questions and doing it in a community with other high schoolers who are wrestling with the same thing. Discipling, mentoring, that's what we're talking about. I want to use another passage. Um, I've lost track of time, so do I need to wrap up soon? I know the polite thing is to say keep going, but don't say that. <laughs> it's 12.15, okay. All right, so I brought with me a yoke. This yoke came from Bolivia. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I was doing a series on living with Jesus. And uh, somebody, I haven't been to Bolivia, but somebody from Bolivia said, I have this in my garage, would you like it? And I said, absolutely. And so I kept it in my office. And um, I love bringing this when I talk about Matthew chapter 11, right? And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the message translation says, thank you for putting it up. I just wanted to say what I think many of us might be familiar with. He says it this way. I think, does it go back one more? Yes. The Father has given me all these things to do and say this is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. That's what the yoke of Jesus is like. And the reason why he used a yoke was because in Jesus' day, to come under a yoke meant you were coming under someone's teaching. It meant you were coming under a rabbi's teaching. Remember, they referred to Jesus as rabbi too. And he said, the problem was, is just before this passage in Matthew 11, there was a lot of not so good religious teachers that were trying to put people under their yoke and it was burdensome. It was heavy. It was not what God was having them to teach people. And so Jesus came along, remember, and he says, the kingdom of God is now an option to you. If you want to really learn about the kingdom of God and what real life is about, come under my yoke and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn from me and you will learn to take a real rest, right? And so a mentor is someone who is living in the yoke with Jesus and 
is inviting someone into that yoke with them. Come get into the yoke of Jesus with me. And let's learn together as fellow disciples of Jesus. A mentor is not somebody who has it all figured out. A mentor is someone who just says, this is what I've been doing. And, and, and let's come learn together by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Because there are different types of mentoring. There are different types of mentoring. There is downward mentoring, where you know someone comes to me, let's say for instance, someone who has never pastored before, and they come to me, go, oh, I need help. I just had a pastor the other day. Call me up, he's been one month. I got this situation, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I said, well, let's see if I do. I might not, but I'll do my best. And we help, right? I'm giving them clear direction. I, it's important that you take these steps. It's important that you call this agency. It's important that da 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 da. There's parallel mentoring, right? Where two people come alongside, they're at the same stages of development, and they, they parallel mentor. And then there's upward mentoring, where the person you're mentoring, you have to remember when you're a mentor, is that. God is always teaching me. So as I may be doing some downward mentoring, i am always got my ears and my eyes and my heart wide open to receive whatever God is teaching me through this mentee. Because we'll learn that way. The last church I was at over at Cala Mesa, Lou Venden was a member there. Some of you might know that name. He was on the search committee when I was interviewing. And I went up to him afterwards. I said, Lou, if, if, if God leads for me to be the pastor at this church... I would be honored to enter a mentoring relationship with you. To just get lunch once in a while. I would love to just learn from your experience. And if you, if you know Lou Venden, he's one of the most humble men. And he said, no, 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 John. I would be learning from you. <laughs> and I said, Lou, let's just make this clear right now. It would clearly be downward mentoring. <laughs> you would be mentoring me. Let me tell you, I had the honor of spending time with him and learning from him. And he was so gracious. And always a learner himself as well. But I share that with you because there are those different stages. It's not, a lot of us have an idea of mentoring that it's me mentoring somebody like downward, but there's always an upward mentoring going on as well, and there's a parallel mentoring. I want to, I want to close with a quick story and then a quote. My apologies for going longer. I really wanted to go 30 minutes, but I failed. (laughs) Um, I was pastoring another church in San Diego. I had been the youth pastor there, the young adult pastor, the associate pastor for 11 years. The senior pastor who had been there for 18 years took a call to go somewhere else. Now at that time, we had, in a sense, two worship services going on at the same time. The senior pastor, when I was, when he was still senior pastor, I don't know, five years before or so, said, John, the young people are not in church. I want them in church. And they're not going to come into this service that we have. He says, would you start another service? And I said, well, if that's what you want. And we started another service. And it blew up. Young people were coming by from all over. They were coming. And God was doing something new, and, and he was still blessing in the other service, but there was this expression that young people were in a place where they felt safe and, and could express in different ways. And so when he left, I had no thought in my mind to be the senior pastor of that church. I didn't want to be the senior pastor of that church. Loved what I was doing. A lot of time to surf, you know, all that type of stuff. Because I was doing it with kids, not just out by myself, just to clarify that. And the elders came to me and said, would you consider being the senior pastor of this church? I about fell off my chair. And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm willing to pray about it. And they said, okay. So long story short, they did some assessing. They brought in an outside organization. They assessed, blah, 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 blah. And they said, we want what's happening here to be for the whole church. That was the most difficult year of ministry in my entire life. When I was going through that first year, I said I would never wish this year on my worst enemy. And when I talk to pastors today and they're transitioning to become a senior pastor, I said, hold on. (laughs) But I'm here. I'm here. Call or text anytime. I'll check in on you. But it's going to be difficult. Well, six months 
into me being the senior pastor of that church, my head elder came to me, who was already the head elder, head elder in the church when I became the pastor, who led the search committee, came to me and said, my wife and I are leaving. Oh, can you give me another six months at least? I was already feeling like it was so difficult. And he said, we're leaving because we just can't take it. We can't take, they love seeing the young people, but they can't take what it was taking to be relevant to the young people. And so I had this deep theological discussion with him. It sounded like this. Do you know who Barney is? He had grandchildren. And he says, you mean the purple dinosaur? <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, the purple dinosaur. He goes, yeah, I know who Barney is. My grandkids love him. I said, I can't stand Barney. <laughs> I can't stand Barney. He irritates me. But my kids love him. My kids love Barney. And when my kids watch Barney and I'm home, they say, Dad, come sit down with us and watch Barney. And I'm like, oh, I hate this. God, give me the strength to sit down and smile while I watch Barney. And I sit down with him and I watch Barney and I fake it till I make it, right? <laughs> you fake it like you like it. And you sit there and you're like, and they're like, isn't that great, Dad? And you're like, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, Barney's awesome. And then it's over. I'm like, oh, thank you. So I was telling this to my head elder at the time and I said, that's what I have to do. I said to this gentleman, I'm not going to say, I'll make up his name. We'll, we'll call him Henry. I go, Henry, you're almost 70. I looked him in the eye and I said, God loves you and you've had your time of preference. I said, it's about the next generation at this point. I said, I said, I love you and God needs you to be present with this next generation. God needs you, as much as you may not like everything that's going on in the service, God needs you as a leader in this church to sit with the young people and be present in their life and to build relationship with them. He thought about it, and he said, I can't do that. And they left. So we had to find a new head elder. Now, don't get me wrong, we didn't end as enemies. We end with appreciation Gratitude for one another, no hard feelings, but it broke my heart. And God went on and did his thing. And the church continued to grow with young people. And that church continues to grow. And all kinds of wonderful things that happen there after I've left. But I share that with you because mentoring means being willing to serve, a servant's heart. And loving people, how? Like Jesus has loved us. Can I remind you of how Jesus loved us? While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, get your look right, get everything right, and then I'll come be with you. He said, I'm going to come be with you and love you. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. The church has to be a place of grace that allows people to make mistakes because we do. And the church has to be redemptive, has to be about reconciliation, and a church has to always be willing to accept everyone in everybody's different stages of process of discipleship growth. Because let's face it, none of us are never where we feel we should be but Jesus doesn't hold that against us. He loves us and enfolds us and embraces us. I want to close with this quote, and thank you for your long-suffering, endurance, and patience this morning. This is such a powerful quote. We'll put it on the screen for you. It says this. I think we have it there. Christianity came to Galilee. We have that? Yeah, yeah, here it goes. Christianity was birthed in Galilee as a relationship. It spread to Greece and became a philosophy. It spread to Rome and became an empire. It spread to Britain and became a culture. It spread to America and became an enterprise. Discipleship is all about relationship with God. Abiding in Him, loving one another, 
and bearing witness as we go about our lives. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the endurance of the saints this morning to be present and to listen. And Lord, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for the grace, the love, the compassion, the mercies that are new every morning. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't ask us to get our act together before you accepted us and received us. But, Lord, you received us and said, don't worry, I will take care of the rest. And so, Jesus, as we think about mentoring today, as we ponder what it means to be a disciple of yours and to disciple others, Lord, we recognize that the only way it happens is by grace through faith, of living authentic, real lives with you, and with each other. At this moment, would you just take a moment in silent prayer to either just listen to what the Spirit may be saying to you this morning in your heart, or maybe you want to say a silent prayer to God in response to what you hear him saying to you this morning.